Well, good morning again. It's a joy to have you with us worshiping today. And uh, so thankful that you've come to Thompson Station Church. Thirty years ago, at the first of this month on the third, I think I mentioned a week or two ago that Leanne and I were married. So the, earlier this month, we we celebrated our 30th anniversary, and Leanne and I met at Southwestern Seminary. She went to Samford in Birmingham. I went to Belmont in Nashville, and we met there and began to date. And um, she only went out with me because I had a really cool Audi 5000 with smoke windows. And she fell in love with the car, and she said, if I have to take the man to get the car, I guess I will. She graduated in May of 1988, and I graduated in December of 1988. And no, that's not because she's so much smarter than me. She got one degree, and I got two while we were there. I know what you're thinking. During the fall of 1988, we knew that upon graduation, somewhere in this world, God had something for us to do. And so I remember pretty distinctly down off a of seminary drive, right off of uh, Southwestern Seminary, they had these uh, really inexpensive apartments that they owned, and they rented them to students. And we're there in a in this uh, in this apartment, and uh, right off of eight twenty, I think was the wraparound interstate there. Uh, I remember distinctly that on several occasions, Leanne and I would go in our bedroom and we'd kneel down by our bed. And during September and October and November, because I graduated in the middle of December, and we just prayed a prayer. I don't remember the words verbatim, but I remember the intent and the heart was, Lord, we have no idea where we're going, but we'll go anywhere you want us to go. Whatever you want us to do, that's what we want to do, and wherever you want us to go. We had... We had no design or intention that we had to be here or there or do this or that. uh, She had her master's in education, and I had my master's in Christian education and my my master's in divinity. I was was actually talking to churches about doing Christian education, uh, Sunday school and whatnot, or being a lead pastor in a smaller church. And and the truth is, is we had contacts from Alexandria, Virginia. We talked to people in Newport Ritchie, Florida. That's in the Tampa, Tampa area. We talked to, to some folks in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. But I think my favorite conversation where we didn't end up was in Tombstone, Arizona. What if I'd have been pastor of First Baptist Church, Tombstone, OK Corral? I mean, put that on your resume, Tombstone. Where do you pastor? Tombstone. But, but that's not where God had us, and we got a call, and thank the Lord, we ended up in partnering with eight people right here in Little Thompson Station, and, uh, you know, some of, some of you younger, even millennials and younger, ask your parents or your grandparents to show you one. They might pull it out of a closet. When we heard about Thompson Station, we pulled out an atlas. Now, I know that y'all have never heard of that. Back then, these didn't exist, and you couldn't, like, Google it and find it on the maps. We pulled out an atlas, and they told us when they called us from Thompson Station that it was south of Nashville and south of Franklin. Well, we could find Nashville on the atlas, and we could find Franklin. We couldn't even find Thompson Station on the atlas map when we were looking for it. So it had 600 mailing addresses at the time. It's a little bigger now. When we were kneeling by our bed that last semester, I had no idea where we would end up. But this is kind of what we said to the Lord. God, we want to go with you. That's it. Today, I'm preaching my anniversary sermon. It's not really my anniversary. My anniversary... We'll have been here 28 years next Sunday on the 29th to the day we were here our first Sunday, January 29, 1989. But next Sunday, it's fitting that we're in another start with Pastor Steve in Las Vegas. And uh, that'll be fitting to be able to be on our anniversary to be in a start that's doing so well and how God is going to bless there just like he blessed here. And we just determined um, to go with God. Now, absolutely... uh, We've made plenty of mistakes through these 28 years. And you've been gracious and tolerated and coached and encouraged and helped. And I can honestly say before the Lord that the mistakes that I've made and we've made through the years have been 
mistakes of the head and not of the heart. And so thank you for your gracious partnership for these 28 years. It's been an amazing journey. The scripture that I preached every year on my anniversary, except one, this will be my 27th time, not my 28th time, to preach out of Joshua chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, go to Joshua chapter 1. For some reason, I just decided I wouldn't do it one year, and I don't know why. The greatest leader who ever lived, Moses, the greatest leader of the Old Testament who ever lived, Moses, the one who talked with God, the one who led Israel out of Egypt, the one who parted the Red Sea with his staff upheld, that man was dead. And now God is raising up a new leader to go forward with the people and win great victories, and his name is Joshua. Today's message is entitled, Go With God in Victory. And that's basically the message of Joshua chapter 1, is anytime you go with God, you win. And I like to win. Now, over the years, I've learned to mask it and cover it. So y'all don't see it as bad, but it's still inside. I confess that 20 years ago when the church was playing in a church league, maybe not 20, I like to make it further away than it was, I I actually got kicked out of a basketball game for like having a technical foul and uh, not proud of it it's the truth and I still have that fire inside I've just learned how to control it a little better as the years have on but I like to win and that's the beauty of going with God you know ultimately you win and Joshua was going to go with God and he was going to win as the people of God are going to go with God and win and if you'll go with God ladies and gentlemen you will win ultimately you'll win Because God always wins. Joshua 1.1. I'm reading from the New American Standard translation. Now it came about that the death of Moses. After the death of Moses the servant of the Lord. That the Lord spoke to Joshua the son of Nun. Moses' servant saying. Moses my servant is dead. Now therefore arise cross this Jordan. You and all this people to the land which I am giving to them. The sons of Israel, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, to the land of the Hittites, as far as the great sea, to the west, toward the setting of the sun, will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you or against you all the days of your life. And just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. Joshua, I will not fail you. I will not forsake you father i just pray that you would uh, move in this moment of teaching from your word reach out from heaven by your spirit and grab our hearts and remind us that if we will go with you we win we will go in victory god you have created us to be the head and not the tail you have created us to be the leader and not the follower you created us to move ahead In your name for great things, individually, as families, and as a church, to bring glory to your name, just as Israel took the promised land. God, you have some promised land for this church to take. You have some promised land for our families to take. You have some promised land for these individuals, all of us to take. And God, challenge and encourage us in this moment, in the study of your word, to do that. Holy Spirit, I yield my mind, my will, my emotions, my mouth, my tongue to you. Speak. Fill me. And I bless your name for it. Amen. We're in our new offices. As a matter of fact, uh, next Sunday, the 29th, we're going to invite you before any of the services, during the hours, if you'll stay a few minutes and take a tour of our offices. We'll be there about 30 minutes after the last service. Love for you to go see our new offices. Thank you for graciously funding that and giving that as a blessing to your staff. It is a beautiful thing to see. We've never been together. So, you know, we're learning how that works, and it's a good thing. And it's really actually helping our culture, and we are, we are doing well with it. Well, by divine providence, we had some extra space between my office and Pastor Dwayne's office. And uh, it turned out, to be honest with you, that we were going to put a bathroom there, but it turned out to be too expensive, and I vetoed it. I would not spend that kind of money. It was several thousands of dollars, and I just wouldn't spend it on just us. And uh, so we had some extra space, and Dwayne had this idea. 
Now, he said, my pastor is not very spiritual, so I need to do whatever I can to help him. He built me a prayer closet right in my office. Says a lot about Dwayne. He's a good man. Also says a lot about your pastor. He needs God's help. So we've been in the office since maybe the middle of December, coming and going, moving, and my office is behind on getting ready because I'm kind of behind. And the truth is, is I've only been in that prayer closet to put some books and Bibles and commentaries and, and a filing cabinet. And, and, and uh, Angela and Terry, they've been working on my office. They're very gracious to do that. Um, but I really hadn't been in there to study, to prepare, or to pray. So Wednesday morning this week in preparing for this message, I, 5 to 7, I went to the prayer room. This is the month of prayer, and all the staff are taking turns, 5 to 7 in the morning, 5 to 7 in the evening. Feel free to come join us in the prayer room anytime in the month of January. After that, I had a quick meeting in my office, and then I went to, to prepare. Now, I, I went into my file, and I pulled out my anniversary sermon file of sermons that I preached, 27 of them, uh, 26 of them from all the past years, and I put them there. And I was reviewing that. I want you to know that I'm not above preaching an outline a second or third time. Now, I'm not above getting an idea from this sermon and using this sermon. Listen, if the music people can sing the same song over and over, how come a preacher can't use the same sermon over? If it preached well once and God's on it, why couldn't it preach well again? So if you stay around here long enough, you might hear me preach the same sermon a time or two. And I hope it gets better with age. So I'm looking through that file, and I'm in that prayer closet, and I'm sitting on my chair, and I have a shelf that's low, and I've got that file, and I'm just flipping and flipping, and, and kind of, I don't want to make it too melodramatic or too mystic or mysterious, but really, it was like this, no, 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 no. That was what the Holy Spirit was saying. And then all of a sudden, I found myself taking that file. Although there was nothing wrong with what I was doing, I took that file and I closed it and I set it aside. And I grabbed up a preaching Bible that I started with at Thompson Station off the shelf. This is not it. It's a new preaching Bible. And I had to bind it with that clear tape on the end and I opened it up. And I put it to Joshua 1 and the Lord said, I want to give you a brand new word for today. And I don't know why today. And I'm telling you, for the next hour and a half or two hours, God met me. In that drywall painted room, it was a sanctuary. It was a prayer room. It was a place where the Spirit of the Lord fell. And my prayer is that in the next 25 minutes, what I preach will be as good as what God gave me. <laughs> I have no idea, but man, it was good in that closet. And so this is just what the Lord spoke for me to tell you. When we go with God. And 28 years ago this month. The Lord called us to go with you. And we're going together. And we're going in victory. Thought number one. Is when you go with God. God speaks to you. Verse 1. Chapter 1. Joshua. Now it came about after the death of Moses. The servant of the Lord. That the Lord spoke to Joshua the son of Nun. The Lord spoke to Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua. 28 and a half years ago, God spoke to me and Leanne. Sitting or kneeling by that bed in Fort Worth, we believe. We know God spoke to us. We know we heard from God. God determined where he would have us serve. And here's what we said. God, anywhere you want us to go. And here's what God said. God said no to Tombstone, Arizona. He said no to Newport, Ritchie, Florida. He said no to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. He said no to Alexandria, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. And he said yes to Thompson Station Church. Now, I don't know why. God just decided that as we knelt there. And God spoke to us. When's the last time you quieted yourself and knelt by your bed or sat in your Bible study chair and said, Lord, speak? I'm listening. Here's what I know. If you go with God, God will speak. God is not mute. God still speaks to this day when you listen. Second thought is, when you go with God, look at verse 2. My servant is dead. Moses is dead. Arise, cross this Jordan, and all this people. When you go with God, take others with you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this journey with God is not a lone ranger journey. This journey with God is not a journey God wants to take you to take by yourself. This journey with God that, that Joshua was beginning wasn't about Joshua being famous or Joshua being elevated or Joshua being the general turned president of the Israelite nation that he could say, I crossed the Jordan in flood state and I defeated the nation of the sons of Anak, the giants in the promised land. This story is about God's greatness taking his people into a land that he promised hundreds of years early and fulfilling his promise to his people. When you go, ladies and gentlemen, you take others with you. That's the journey of faith. One day, everybody in this room and and everybody watching live stream and even everybody listening to this tomorrow or this week or next month, ladies and gentlemen, you're not hearing this by accident. This is providential, sovereign God speaking to you that in your journey of faith, take people with you. And everybody that's listening or hearing is going to die. Life is terminal. And the only thing that's going to keep you from dying is Jesus comes back before your ticker quits ticking. That's it. Life's terminal. And when you die, if you know Christ, you're going to heaven. But you'll not take a mutual fund. You'll not take a nice car. You don't take a house. You don't take a swimming pool. The only thing you can take with you, I think, is the influence you've given on other souls as they may come with you. Ladies and gentlemen, don't take this journey by yourself. Say, God, help me take others with me. And moms and dads, start with your own kids. Pour into them daily, weekly, monthly that this is a life journey you make with Christ. And then move out from your own family to your neighbors, to your co-workers, to the coaches that coach your kids. And wherever you go, take somebody, several somebodies with you. And that's what God told Joshua to do. Third thought, when you go with God, you have to make some effort. You say, well, you know, if God's doing this, why doesn't he just get it done? Don't know. Look at verse 2. Arise and cross this Jordan. Pack your bags. Get ready to go. It will take some sacrifice. It will take some hard work. When God gave this message, let me back up. I don't know why God just doesn't do it by himself. Here's the truth. I imagine that God gets frustrated from time to time. Not really, because you can't frustrate God because he's God. But you would think he would get frustrated when he has to work through flawed people like us. And he looks down and says, oh, for the umpteen time, for crying out loud, Tom, can't you get that right? I'm glad he's perfect God. I mean, I don't guess he gets flustered. But if he could, I'm sure I would fluster him. But yet he invites us on the journey. That's the joy of the faith journey, that God doesn't leave us out. He says, I want you to go with me, and I'm going to let you be a part of the process. And he's inviting Joshua to be part of the process. Moses is dead, and now Joshua's leading. And and he goes. the men go throughout and say, pack your bags, because in three days, God's going to do an amazing work. Now, this River Jordan, and you might have in your mind, this is a tranquil little creek. They're just going to wade across this eight inches. This is flood stages of the Jordan. It's piled up. Water's deep and the current's fast. And here they are. They're going to march across it. There is an effort to be made. Can you imagine that first priest and the guys that are carrying the Ark of the Covenant and the river Jordan is just flowing and, and they're going and, I mean, before they get in, oh, my Lord, help me, Jesus, or whatever they're praying. And then they have to step in. That priest did not know that God was going to shut the water off way back at Adam, and it was going to dry up before them. He didn't, he didn't know that. And he walked out in faith. And God provided the answer by drying up the riverbed. They didn't know exactly how every nine-foot giant Do you know that the sons of Anak, that Goliath is not the only giant in the Bible. We know that there was at least four brothers or cousins, and we think there are multiple giants in the land. You remember the report when the spies came back? We're leany teeny grasshoppers in their sight. They didn't know how it was going to work out, but they had to work it out and walk it out. Ladies and gentlemen, it takes effort when you want to go with God. It's not for the faint of heart. 
you look through the book of, of, of Joshua, chapter 6, they defeat Jericho, but they have to work it out. Now they get defeated at Ai because the first time somebody took some spoil from the last battle, remember Achan put it under his, his blanket in his, in his tent, and so many of Israelites died because the one man sinned. But when they, after that sin was taken care of, they, whooped, they went back and whipped Ai easily. You've got to get sin out of the camp. And then, and then they defeat, they defeat uh, the, the five kings in chapter 10. So victory after victory after victory. But they had to make the effort. They had to go into battle. You know, anything worth having, ladies and gentlemen, it takes effort to get it. And the only place success comes before work is in the dictionary. Work it out. When you go with God, you have to fight some battles. Here's a fourth thought. When you go with God, big things are coming your way. Verse 3, every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given to you, just as I spoke to Moses. Your territory, verse 4, will be this big, desert to Lebanon, from the river, great river Euphrates to all the Hittite country, out to the west of the Mediterranean. Every place your foot steps, I have given it to you. What does that mean? Every place your foot doesn't step, I haven't given to you. Ladies and gentlemen, where haven't you stepped? Believing God for something amazing. Where have you said, I just don't know that that can happen. I, I, I just think God's big, but not that big. Here's what I like. When you read that verse, every place the sole of your foot treads, I have given you. That's past tense. It's a done deal. God already has your success planned and secured. Yes, you have to make an effort. Yes, you have to do the work. Yes, you have to walk it out. Yes, you have to fight the battles. But God's already given you the victory. Last night I had some dinner with new friends up in Barbecue in Franklin. There were two young couples I really enjoyed getting to know. And then there was uh, then another couple that invited us. And the other couple is made up with another beautiful young lady and then an old man. So the old man and I were talking after dinner. We got back to his house. And, I, you know, anytime God gives you a word, you can't wait till Sunday. So I like anybody as I'm around. I've been preaching this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I've just been preaching. When I told him this story, he said, this is what that means. you got to have faith and fight to win. I said, boom, faith and fight. I gave him more credit. I told him I was just going to say it and say it was mine, but God convicted me that I had to give him credit. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have faith and fight? Because that's the Christian walk. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. Yes, he rose from the dead. Yes, he's coming back again. But between the time you die or he comes back again, he's calling you to go for the big things he has prepared for you. There's a promised land for your family. Don't fall short. Don't stay on the wrong side of the Jordan in life saying, this little bit is enough. Say, I'm going with God. Because he has big things coming my way. You know how big the promised land is? 60,000 square miles, the best we can calculate. 60,000 square miles is about the size of the state of Georgia. That's pretty big. God has something pretty big for you. Now, if you want a New Testament scripture to correlate to what I've just said... Every place the sole of your foot treads, I have given you. Have faith and fight it out. Walk it out. Listen, if you go to Matthew 18, I think it's Matthew 18, 16, 17, 18. You don't have to go there. Write it down. The Scripture says this. Whatsoever you bind on earth, I will bind in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. Now, I like that scripture, but I want to give you the proper Greek interpretation of that. I do not dictate to God what he does. If you find the parse, if you parse those phrases in Greek, you'll find the actual 
English translation is, whatsoever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. What I'm saying is God's already done the work in the heavenlies. The archangel and the angel are defeating demonic forces. God's giving you spiritual authority and wants to bless you spiritually. And I believe physically and I believe financially. I don't have any problem with that. But God's already loosed it in the heavenlies. And he's waiting for Tom to walk it out in the earthly. Whatsoever we, that's a woo, that's right. Whatsoever you, golly, Moses, I'm preaching my guts out, Lord. We settle for too small. We say, oh, we can't redeem that relationship. Oh, we're never going to make it. I'm stuck in this lot of life. It's never going to be a success. That is failure. Language. Don't speak in failure language. Speak in faith language and fight language. I have a God who never loses. Therefore, as his son or daughter, I'm not losing. I'm not losing. So would you put faith and fight together and trust God for a big promised land for you, your family, and your church? I'm telling you, I'm excited for this future of Thompson Station Church. We're on our way to big things. When you go with God, number five, your enemies and obstacles fall before you. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life, Joshua. What an, ama- what an amazing and wonderful part of being in a right relationship with God. With God, you cannot lose no matter what happens. That's a beautiful thing. You think, well, this is a big enemy. Huh. You got a bigger God. This is a big obstacle. You got a bigger God. I've done this before years and years ago. Maybe not even years ago. Let me do it again. It's chapstick. That's a tiny piece of little wax for my lips. It's just little bitty. I can see it from there. It's little bitty. Close one eye. I put this chapstick right here. That's all I can see. See, in reality, if I look at it from a distance, it's tiny. And most of the obstacles and enemies before you are tiny. They're all tiny compared to God. But instead of putting them out there in perspective where they should be, that in my future, God will deliver me. I let that obstacle, I let that enemy get right up in my eye, right in front of it, and it consumes me. And I put all my emphasis on I put all my emphasis on the wrong syllable, and I look at the obstacle in the enemy instead of the one who delivers me. Everything against you crumbles when God is with you. Everything crumbles. Let me give you, a, let me give you the last thought. When you go with God, you're never alone. I love it. Verse 5, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Ladies and gentlemen, you are never by yourself when God's on your side, when you're a Christ follower, when Jesus is the Lord of your life. Now, can, can you just sense the sigh of relief in Joshua? The moment that God said to Joshua, remember Moses, your mentor, the leader, your boss, your commander, all these years you followed him, remember him? Just like I was with Moses, Joshua, I'm going to be with you. And in that millisecond when God said that, what, what, what probably ran through Joshua's mind? I'll tell you what ran through his mind. The ten amazing miracles that took place back in Egypt. He was there for every one of them. And the God who worked through Moses, through those ten miracles, those ten, those miraculous undertakings and signs, that's the God with Moses. And then I bet he thought about, oh my goodness, that... The God who was with Moses then, that's the same God who, when Moses held up his rod on the Red Sea, that Red Sea parted just like, 
like that. That's the same Moses that, that when, when, when the children of God were hungry out in the desert and there was no foliage, nothing to eat, and, and Moses talked to God, God dropped wafers of bread from heaven called manna. And when Joshua began to think about that, I think a little dance got up in his feet and said, Woo! That God who was with Moses is with me. And whatever God did through Moses, God can do through me. Hey, come in here close. Whatever God did through Moses and God did through Joshua, God can do through you. Don't you miss that. I'm not talking about a God who works through special people. I'm talking about a God who works through anybody who will go with him. You see, we think, oh, it's about the man Moses. It's about the man Joshua. Oh, it's about the man Peter or the man Paul or the man David or the woman Deborah or the sister Phoebe. Romans 16. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not about any of us. It's about our great God. I visited a buddy yesterday, Billy Barnhill, who had a kidney removed this last week. And uh, if Billy was there in the OR, the operating room, up in Franklin, and I was in there and I had that mask on, and I had all these specialized tools. I had every instrument under the sun. I had the right scalpel and the forceps and, I mean, the crowbar and the, and the, uh, the pliers and the snips. I had everything you need to remove that kidney. And I was the one doing it. Billy probably wouldn't be living today, even if I had the right instruments. But in an emergency case, a trained surgeon could have taken my one-and-a-half-inch, two-inch little pocket knife, if he had to, And probably save Billy's life by removing that kidney. Now why is that true? It is never about the tool or the instrument. It's about who wields it. Ladies and gentlemen. God will wield you as an amazing tool in his hand. To do amazing work. Surgery on this world if you will. If you'll say God you are my God. I am your child. And I put my life in your hands. It's never about the instrument or tool, it's about who's holding the tool. Will you let God hold you and use you to bring your family and your church into an amazing promised land? You are never alone. We couldn't even find Thompson Station Church on the Atlas. We couldn't find Thompson Station. 600 mailing addresses. We came, we started with eight sweet people. Two retired couples, a 28 and a 30-year-old, a 4 and a 6-year-old. And Leanne and I joined. That eight became 10. I turned that into the office. Man, we had 25% growth our first week. Whoop, whoop, we were leading the association in growth. One neighborhood. Drive down Thompson Station Road, and you'll see the one neighborhood on your right. That was all that was here. Country Haven Drive. On the first Saturday in February, sleeting, raining, about 33 degrees, Leanne and I drove up in our amazing, beautiful Buick Skylark or something. I can't even remember. It was, it was something. We got out and we started knocking on doors. Knocked on about 20 or 25 doors that first day. And from those 25 doors we knocked on, we baptized five adults in the next six months. In March, one of those adults that I led to the Lord, we had a, in March of that year, we had a block party, a neighborhood party. We grilled out, invited everybody in the neighborhood, and that jump started Thompson Station Chapel into where we are today. And, and, and you see, what God has done in the last 28 years, He wants to do it over and over And over and over again in all of our lives. That's what God wants to do. One of those couple that that were there that I baptized in a swimming pool in March. Because we didn't have a baptistry. Randy and Susan Kaufman served faithfully every Sunday. They're greeters and they're teachers and they're leaders. Trustee of our church. And they're just great servants. And, And friends, Thompson Station Church is full of great servants. Thank you. We're on our way. Last Sunday, we had, we had over 1,900 in worship. That's 125 more than we had a year before. But you know what I think? I think we can do that two or three times. 
I think this time next year we could have well over 2,000 and beyond. I, th I think that God is doing a fresh new work through us. I don't think it. I know it. I believe it. I speak those things as truth because I know God has ordained our steps. And I know that if I'll have faith and fight, God will bring to pass that which he's already won. The victories that heaven holds are ours if we walk them out. Ladies and gentlemen, victory did not take place on the cross. Don't stop there. Don't cut it off there. Victory took place in eternity past when God determined that he'd win us back through the cross. It already happened. Even Jesus, think about it, even Jesus had to walk it out. Now, he didn't have to have faith. He is God. But you know what he had to do? He walked it out. He went to the cross. He came out of the grave. He sits on the right hand of God. And all we have to do is have faith and have fight. And the victory is ours.